welcome to another program in our series, Candidate Forum. Uh, I'm delighted today to, uh, to have with me two very valued members of our Minnesota electorate. Uh, I, I'm Bill Weir, the producer and host of the program, and I have the three-time elected uh, State Auditor Rebecca Otto. Thank you, Rebecca, for being with us. You're now running for state uh, governor, and I, I commend you on what I've seen so far of your campaign. It's getting across. And to, to help me with the many questions that we have, <laughs> why Spano, right. uh, th who m many of you know from his publication, Politics in Minnesota, and his many appearances on television, uh, such as Almanac. Uh, Good to be here. With, along with T.J. Leary often. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I'm going to invite Y to uh, ask most of the questions today because my voice is not in the best of shape. Okay. Why do you want to start? You bet. Well, Auditor Otto. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with... Uh, you got a really good job, a, an interesting, demanding job, and running for governor has got to be kind of a lot of work. Yes. What, what caused you to do this? What, what's interesting about it? Um, you know, I've served for three terms as state auditor, and I've been in every corner of the state. I've been in fire halls, town halls, city halls, gymnasiums, cafes, <clears throat> and worked to solve problems at the local level. So we oversee about 20 billion spent per year by all of our communities around the state, different mm -hmm. forms of local government. And I've been able to serve on six state boards, which is also fascinating work around financing of farms and housing, you know, uh, financing affordable housing, public pensions, investments, natural resources, state emergencies. Um, and I accomplished everything I had hoped to as state auditor. I actually had really definitive goals of things I wanted to accomplish for Minnesotans to make sure our state was on a good path and helping our local officials um, be good stewards of public funds. And so it was really about being proactive and helping them be successful so that we continue to be a good government state. With my business background, my master's of education and teaching, and some of the things I did before I started serving in public office and my time in the legislature as well as on a school board, I'm at a point in my life where I decided I wanted to run for governor because I bring a lot to the table in terms of my finance background, my business background, my teaching background, my conservation background, and I think it's a perfect fit for Minnesota. And so I've come out with a statewide vision called Renew Minnesota. And there's some very exciting components to it, and I look forward to sharing that with Minnesotans. But I'm running to end what I call the politics of unfettered greed and make sure we're focusing on the common good. Politics of greed is all that dark money that pours into our elections. It is, um, you know, groups that are really out to enhance their big industry to enhance our bottom line, but it could really erode our quality of life in Minnesota. And I want to make sure that government is transparent, accountable, and that it's focused on the work of the people. And I, I know Minnesotans are frustrated with electing leaders and then not having things be done. You know, we want them to solve real world problems. And I bring a skill set and um, a deep, deep knowledge that I think would serve us very well. So I'm asking Minnesotans for their, for their support. If you don't mind, let's follow up on that, uh, on, on the money coming in. Uh, I, as you know, was involved a lot in politics over the years and used to write about it. And, and, and we used to have this kind of closed election system here where you as a state house candidate would raise, I think it was around 20 grand and and that was it and that's you got to control the campaign mm -hmm. i talked this last session i was up quite a bit candidates have no idea where the money is coming from who's what the issues are going to be how, how what can we do about that well if i if there was a way to stop it i would love to at least to make sure there's transparency i think everyone should have to account for what they're saying doing I mean, we now know the Russians had a big hand in the last presidential election and did some pretty extraordinary things in terms of trying to influence um, public sentiment around our presidential election. That's pretty scary times that we're in. Um, but we're in a global economy. So the world has changed. And I know that in House and Senate races in Minnesota, um, they'll run ads on cable, not that expensive. You know, they'll do all kinds of things and, and pay for lit. 
um, sometimes the tune of a million dollars now, which is pretty extraordinary. So big money is out there. It has an influence. Um, I'm a truth teller. I always have been in government, and I will call it out as I see it as I'm running for governor. Minnesotans can expect there will be big money coming into the state, and they have a very specific, they all have their own agenda, and it's not always what's best for the for Minnesotans themselves. And I will be calling it out and making sure that people understand what's going on. But it is a big, big problem, and transparency is required. So it sounds like you expect that one issue in this campaign is going to be where is it all coming from, who's saying it, and what's going to play out. For yeah. And I really hope that the media will serve in a role that works to find out what's the truth and what's not in terms of fact checking or whatever else. I know there's sometimes some outlets that will do that. It's going to be very, very important because as we know, campaigns start rolling and moving very fast. TV ads come up, you start seeing the, you know, the ones with the scary music and they turn your face green and <laughs> 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 I contend that Minnesotans are pretty smart people. And, and um, so, uh, you know, it's going to happen. It always happens. And what I think is unfortunate in our political system and keeps some people from running, and why people say, why are you running? Because they get into the politics of personal destruction where they try to destroy you. Um, but, you know, I, uh, I'm running anyway. I know who I am. People know who I am. They know my leadership, my integrity, that I'm willing to fight for what's right. And I will do all that I can um, to try to become the governor of Minnesota that's all transparent and accountable. And if Minnesotans don't choose me, so be it. But I, I um, am hopeful. Great. Uh, what do you think are going to be other major issues in this campaign besides that kind of transparency, which is sort of taken over everything these days? But yeah, because the people are a real disadvantage, especially with Citizens United. We have all these things that are kind of right. piling up that are going to make it that put our system out of balance. Because there's a place for industry, but not at the expense of our quality of life. And they've got the money, and we don't necessarily have the money. But um, you know, so it is. It's tricky. But I would say uh, equality of opportunity. You know, and, and what I mean by that is I, I did a listening tour across the state, 36 different community conversations starting in January, rather than a speaking tour or listening tour, to work to understand Minnesotans' hopes and dreams, as well as their concerns and struggles. And there were certain things that were the same no matter where I went. But what I found was we don't have a quality of opportunity, and I mean economic opportunity. There's pockets all over the state where people are undercompensated or underemployed. And the same things keep us up at night, whether you live in um, War Road, Caledonia, Crookston, May Township, Minneapolis, you know, wherever you live, the same things keep us up at night, keeping roof over our head, food on our table, clothes on our back, and our health. So my agenda is going to be economic, economic and around our health care system. Because those are the fundamentals that affect all of us, whether you live in greater Minnesota or the metro area or you know, in the suburbs or the excerpts. Another piece, and then also just our health care system, which is being debated at the federal level, but it's a really important thing. Um, Minnesotans should be able to receive care, and we need equity in the system. We have great inequities right now. And we don't have anything that's really controlling costs. We must get at costs. So I have something I'll be releasing. Um, and depopulation is one of the issues that greater Minnesota is really struggling with. Mm -hmm. So for me, when I'm looking at my economic agenda, part, my, the first part is called the Minnesota Powered Plan. We need to diversify our economy in a meaningful way and work to generate that next generation of jobs. So much is getting automated. And, um, and so we need to understand that. And as governor, there's certain things you can do, but I've got my Minnesota Powered Plan, which will diversify the economy, create the next generation of clean energy jobs, which pay very well and support a family, they will be statewide. So, so first it's providing that additional economic opportunity in greater Minnesota, as well as finding a viable third and fourth crop for our farmers when commodity prices are down, which corn and dairy are right now. And broadband internet. So broadband is one of those great equalizers. And my focus will be local economies, local business, local farms, local banks. Local businesses and homegrown businesses tend to be better stewards in our communities. So that's my focus. And no matter where I went, when broadband isn't available, it's really difficult to do basic things in our communities. Oh, Fergus Falls, I was in the city, they said it's pretty good here, but you get a couple miles out and it's not so great, you get a little further out and it's dial up. Well, I've met a businessman in Cannon Falls who said to me, he, international business he does. And he said, you know, UPS can find me and ship my products, 
but he said it's pretty embarrassing to have to send you know documents and files on a thumb drive. Wow. So it's, it's, we need to make sure that we've leveled the economic playing field. And it's not just economic, it's allowing people to connect with each other, families and, and um, experts that might want to mentor others and, you know, that may not live near each other on business or whatever else it may be. So, so those are some of the issues, is level the economic playing field, diversify the economy, and also attract the innovators. And I'm going to do that with my health plan that's coming out soon. Um, the ACA didn't work so well for our small business people, mm -hmm. for consultants, for farmers, and so I have a plan coming out that will provide for a universal, universal, publicly financed, guaranteed, quality, affordable healthcare system. Mm. And by doing that, you remove a big burden from our small business community. You, we will be the magnet for the innovators in the nation. It's worth going after and worth getting done. And I believe we can get it done because I had a Republican come to one of my listening sessions <laughs> and all he wanted to talk about was single payer health care. He said, we've got to get there. He's a, he was a three generation small businessman. Wow. So I think that people understand the economics of this at this point. Minnesotans get it. They're, they're pretty smart, pretty savvy. So it's just making the system, helping the system to evolve, taking the best pieces of our health care system and helping it further evolve to that universal system. I've always been um way puzzled over why candidates haven't been talking about statewide availability for high-speed internet. Talk about how you're going to do it. Have to. Well, working on a plan. I'll be releasing that as part of my five-part plan, which is, so my, my statewide vision is called Renew Minnesota. Okay? My first piece is called the Minnesota Powered Plan. It's on my website, RebeccaAuto.com. There's other pieces coming, and we'll be dealing with that broadband piece. How do we do it? How do we get it out there? Even when there is broadband service in parts of greater Minnesota, the costs are very high. And there's concern. Do people really have access? And they're frustrated. Right. The quality is not always there. My house, I live out in the, um, on a farm, out on a dirt road, and on the edge of the metro, and our internet drops in and out and in and out. And it is very frustrating. So when we want to allow people to telecommute, you know what I mean? There's some great advances that have been made. But when you don't have reliable internet, it really makes it difficult really makes it difficult. And I was in Douglas County in the library the other day, and I was doing some work on my uh, iPad in between um, some meetings, and it was dropping in and out. And so it's, 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 uh, we need to understand the importance of that. It's like the electrification of America. Talk, if you would, about the uh, 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 Minnesota Power Plan in terms of the conservation elements and alternative power, that sort of thing. Yes. So I've released something called the Minnesota Powered Plan. It's a clean energy plan. It's an economic plan. Um, it is a health plan. There's all kinds of great components. So, and it's being talked about internationally. So it's, it's pretty neat. And it's the greatest economic, economic opportunity we've had in a generation. It'll generate at least 70,000 jobs, if not a quarter million. It is going to place a price on carbon. The revenue we collect from that is going to go directly to Minnesotans. There's no taxes. It's revenue neutral. We're going to reflect the price of carbon when we burn it and the impact it has on insurance and everything else. It is going to empower Minnesotans to take charge of their energy. So this is on a residential basis. So if you're Minnesota, you're going to get a quarterly dividend check. And um, for, the, for the average person, it's going to probably be about $600 a year. If you have four people in your family, you're going to get $2,400. So that dividend um, can either hedge against increased costs of fossil fuels in the future or you can use it to make investments. 75% um, of the carbon price will be in dividend checks. 25% of the money will be available in what we call a refundable clean energy tax credit. So if you're a homeowner, and let's say you wanted to install um, some solar panels on your roof, that tax credit will cover 30% of that cost. You want to install a heat pump and you live in a home, it'll cover 30% of that cost. You could stack that with federal tax credits too and then finance it, and sometimes you're going to come out ahead. Um, you could um, have a contractor come in and do some energy efficiency measures for you, including installing triple pane windows. That's going to be covered. If you drive a car, not everybody does, but if you do, an, an electric vehicle, either new or used, will qualify for that tax credit. So 30% off the cost of that car. Again, you can stack it with federal tax credits. And so what we're doing is we're moving away from burning of fossil fuels we must. We can't ignore the strange weather events that are happening. You can look at Puerto Rico, you can look at Houston. When we have animals washing out of the zoo in Duluth, we have to admit we've got a problem. 
So burning fossil fuels is having an impact and it's creating a supercharged, much more frequent weather events that are costing us money in our infrastructure, civil infrastructure. It's costing lives. People are having to be moved and, and leave where they live. So this is going to reduce our carbon emissions. This plan, in tw over 25 years, I think it's 81%, it's gonna reduce our carbon emissions. It's mm -hmm. huge, but what's really great right now is that the price point is right. So financially, we can do this stuff now. So big wind is now cheaper than coal mm -hmm. in terms of producing energy. Big mm -hmm. solar is becoming cheaper than coal. So this is simply using Minnesota resources, Minnesota wind, Minnesota sun. I mean, why wouldn't we? We're not gonna be um, stuck with having to be controlled by others that, you know, in the Middle East or wherever else that have these, these fossil fuels. We're gonna start using our resources. My plan requires Minnesota companies, Minnesota workers. So this is really improving Minnesotans' lives, greatest economic opportunity in a generation. We will attract other innovators and have R&D and spin-off businesses. We should be leading the clean energy revolution in Minnesota. That's what we wanna be known for is being smart. And frankly, there is an imperative that we do this because it's infecting our children now and, we, and they deserve that we as a state get on this now. And my plan is revenue neutral, no taxes, and it allows the free market to adjust to this plan. So it's actually been endorsed by Paul Douglas, who's a Republican and a, a well-respected meteorologist, Bill McKibben, lots of weighed in and said, this is really what we should be doing. Um, and there's great benefits that go with it. Mm. And I can say, it's, it's, I have a wind generator, I've got solar panels, I've got geothermal heating and cooling. Heat pumps can replace the traditional you know, gas burning furnaces. It can cool your house, heat your house, and heat your water. So again, it's just moving away from what we've done traditionally, empowering Minnesotans to do this, helping everyone. Let's say you live in an apartment. You're never gonna own a home. You're never gonna own a car. We designed our program to make sure that landlords of these of, you know, residential buildings can also take advantage of the tax credits to convert what they're doing to lower the utility costs for the renters. So we're trying to make sure everyone can see themselves in this plan. Great. Tie that then to transportation which is an issue that uh, we've done gobbled at a lot in Minnesota, as you know, for a number of years. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, Republicans seem to want not to have gas taxes, and generally speaking, Democrats seem not to want to have Republicans take the money out of the general fund so, because they're kind of, there seems to be a great deal of suspicion that they're they're gonna just drop social payments of, or social helping payments of any kind in order to pay for the transportation. Uh, but aside from that, just talk about well, like the more conservative the more conservative financial model is that you um, that you bond when you're doing right. capital improvements or you're, if you have a, a capital asset that's gonna have a longer life, you do not use general fund money. So if you're gonna look at it, doing it the conservative way, which to me is really the right way financially to do it, you're gonna you're gonna bond for it and we should be doing much more with long-term financial planning around our roads and bridges as well as our other civil infrastructure i think that's one area that we could do a much better job in and i'm all about long-term financial planning because when you do it and you do it right and you're um, thoughtful about it you have better outcomes it's less expensive better outcomes and so for me as governor i will all be all about that long-term financial planning transparency about what we're doing and what we're not doing so, but we should not be using general fund money to fund our no, infrastructure. No, but, but, but we do use general fund money usually to pay the bonds then. You're okay with right, that? Right, right, right. But just doing one-time spending out of the general fund to do projects is not the best no, idea. It's no, not a good no. idea. Now, when you say transportation as well, you also have public transportation. Right. So there's something I do know. You said, what issues are going to be coming up? We're aging as a state. And when, as we age, um, we're all aging. We know this. Um, but we are generally as a population, it takes proper planning to make sure we have good outcomes. Again, I'm a long-term financial planner and we're not all gonna drive till we're 92, hopefully. <laughs> and so public transportation is critical, not only for our aging population to make sure our fellow Minnesotans can maintain some sense of independence. Millennials don't necessarily want to drive cars and what, want public transportation options. They're becoming a bigger and bigger part of our workforce. They get to choose where they live so, and then we have um, folks with disabilities, fellow Minnesotans that with disabilities who also need public transportation. Public transportation is also part of a vibrant economy. 
and, and, and getting people back and forth. It's not just one population, it's a whole bunch of people. So we need to make sure that we also have a plan in place for that, that component. Um, and I believe the business community generally supports that. And we have public transportation outside of the metro area. It's not just in the metro. We have hubs around greater Minnesota that also has it. But I was up in Ely, and I was with a senior population, lots of retirees, and they said to me, Rebecca, we'd really love to have some buses that would get us to certain places too because we're not all going to drive forever. So there's really a demand, and we're going to have to figure out, again, having a long-term plan. What I don't like is when the politics of creed rears its ugly head and says, you know, public transportation is only for certain types of people. That's nonsense. There's lots of Minnesotans that would appreciate the, um, the efficiency of it and the convenience of it. And frankly, reducing um, burning carbon is, is good too. Um, and we're moving to electric buses, which is very exciting. There's even electric school buses out there that we may be moving to. So the world is changing. The world is changing. And we also must change with it and do that planning. Um, in terms of funding, um, our roads and, and figuring out, you know, we've, we've used the gas tax for a long time. <coughs> With my Minnesota Powered Plan, that's going to have diminishing returns. So I will be coming out with a plan talking about how I would suggest that we fund our infrastructure. And um, that'll be coming. So watch mm. my website. All right. Let's talk about uh, education, since uh, that is where still an awful lot of the money goes. Mm -hmm. uh, K-12 uh, is the largest, but let's start with, uh, with uh, early childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, had, we've had some interesting fights over that. In the last uh, session, uh, the governor basically was looking for uh, universal early childhood. Um, many said, well, how about we just pay for poor people? Talk about that differentiation. Sure. So I actually have a master's of education and I taught in the schools and I got my master's from the University of Minnesota, great research institution. We understand brain development. We understand that those really early years for a child, especially like prenatal to three, there's a lot of brain development that occurs. I think our preschool programs are for, um, or pre-K are for four-year-olds. And I also know that not all of our children are succeeding in our schools right now for a variety of reasons. We need a quality of opportunity. When you have a job and a roof over your head, everything gets better. When kids can be in one place yeah. and their parents, you know, they've got stability. So that's why I wanna work on diversifying the economy and making sure we have a quality of opportunity. For our children that are at risk, um, we need to do as much as we can so that they have positive outcomes too. We need all of our children in Minnesota to succeed. And so, I know there was a move to try to push for universal pre-K, and I think that again that gets to about the four-year-olds. I will come out with a plan, but I would just, you know, food for thought. If if we, you know, those earlier years are actually when there's a lot of brain development going on, and I would like I'm interested in looking at getting resources, targeted resources, to the children that need it the most in those younger years. That would be probably the direction I'd like to go. But that'll be coming out in my education plan as well because <clears throat> K-12 is a big part of our, um, that's a big part of our budget. And so it's always about, you know, what, where are we gonna put our resources and where are they most impactful? And when you have money and dollars that you could invest in those early years, I do wanna target it for, to the children that, that need it the most. And the earlier you can do it, the better it is. And it can also be accomplished through education and some different programs, I'll be coming out with something. <laughs> but you know what, here's what I know. When our son was born, I had done all this research, I had a master's, and I wanted to give him every advantage, because I'd seen brain scans with kids that had been read to and heard language, and so the first day that our son was born, I was in the hospital holding him all swaddled, and I was reading him a book. <laughs> my, mom said, my mom said, honey, what you doing? And I said, well, I'm reading. And she said, well, I can see that. Why are you reading? And, and she said, because I don't think he's understanding much. And I said, Mom, because I know that this is good for him, that I know it's going to help his little brain develop um, and, and you know, have more com complex synapse you know, connections, and it's going to help him down the road. So I knew what the research showed, and I worked to implement that with our son, who's just a great young man now. <laughs> but we know it works, and so it's really just um, targeting those resources. Hmm. So that's pre-K, K-12, big part of what we do. I taught seventh grade life science, and I say if you can teach 195 seventh graders, 12 and 13 year olds, you can do anything. 
<laughs> and I will be an evidence-based governor. I really believe in science and evidence. Um, so it is a big part of what we do, and not all of our children are succeeding. And I, I actually would contend we've got some inequities in the system. And your zip code should not determine your um, you know, success in school. And um, levies, you know, having to go out for operating levies and bond referendums, it, it gets very tiring. I did that many years ago. And um, so I will, again, work to address that in my plan. But here's the thing about Minnesota. Our intellectual capital is one of our greatest assets. It has served us very, very, very well. And we understand that. And we actually take great pride in our education system. And so we, if we forget that, we're, gonna, we're not gonna have the Fortune 500 companies and all the innovators and folks that come here because they know that's what we have. So we can't forget it, we, make, we have to make sure we continue to invest in it. And I would like to work on inequities that I'm currently seeing in the system um, to make sure we're doing our very, very best. And another thing, when I was in listening, my listening tours in Greater Minnesota, I had one superintendent say, is there any way, Rebecca, that you can say we're not gonna close any more schools? That we're at the floor now? Because when you don't have a school and you're trying to attract young families to support your Main Street right. businesses, to fill your schools, to engage in your community, um, it gets really rough. And, and then daycare is that other issue in Greater Minnesota where there's not a lot there. So how do you attract those young families? So one, broadband. Two, schools. And, and, and when you're, a child is on a bus for an hour going to their school, my son actually rode an hour on the bus to school, but when you're riding an hour in and an hour back, is that the best we can do? So we really need to look at that piece in Greater Minnesota. And frankly, sometimes our schools are our largest employer. They're your mm -hmm. community center, your pool, your gymnasium, your theater, it's, you know, it's your everything. So um, I want to work to repopulate our communities and allow them to have that sense of pride with schools and make sure we're doing our very best that we can so they can attract those young families. I must admit I was always kind of puzzled by the, the con consolidation movement because one of the purest charts I ever saw outcome was the relationship between the size of school and the outcomes of the students. And they were inversely proportional. The smallest schools always have the best students, and then it goes down that way. And, and you think, yes, why does everybody want to get rid of those little schools? Well, we, di we did a lot about, you know, you have to have all of these programs, and you have to save money, and da 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 but as you say, it tears the guts out of a town. It really, really does. And, and it, how are you relevant if you don't have a school nearby? Yeah. And, and, um, and so we have work to do. We have work to do in Minnesota.